Right, anyway, I have managed to bluff my way through about 20 minutes of an introduction. So it's seven o'clock, we are ready to get started. So welcome to the beginner guide to macro photography. So let's just have a look um, as to what we're starting off with. Um, Jane, don't worry, it's lovely to have you here. You're not late, you're literally just perfectly timed. Um, so what's this webinar gonna cover? Um, you can see from the list of introductions here, just briefly go through it. We're gonna firstly kind of define what macro photography is um, because there is maybe a little bit of spuriousness uh, without it. Um, we'll look at magnification ratios. I'll explain what they are. Don't worry if you don't know what any of these things are at the minute, this is exactly what the webinar is for, for me to explain. Talk about camera choices, lens, choices, accessories, be it extension tubes, filters, whether you should be using manual or autofocus, tripod, handheld, all those little variables, people aren't ever so sure. One person will tell you one thing, one person will tell you another. Sometimes there isn't just one right answer, which is normally the way in photography, which makes it always a little bit more harder to teach in one respect, because it's down to personal preference. Um, and then we'll look at setting exposures, using flash and lighting and uh, focus. And we've got a nice little showcase of your brilliant images that you guys have been sending in to me uh, to wrap up our webinar. So say any questions throughout the webinar, just throw them into the comments. I'll do my best to jump forwards and backwards and, and catch them as well. Um, but otherwise, yeah, let's kind of crack on. So we're starting off with having a look as to what is and isn't considered macro photography. So macro photography is it's very interesting and it can seem kind of quite technical on the outside. Um, and for some people that aren't really, you know, they're not that well hearsed in macro photography, it can feel a little bit overwhelming. And this is maybe why it puts so many people off thinking that you need an extremely expensive camera, an extremely expensive lens, lots of different accessories, which is not necessarily the case. Obviously the better that you want to get and the better quality images that you want to get, yes, those elements can help, but it's not to say that you can't start off from a basic level. Um, so yeah, don't don't feel necessarily that you know it's only a professional camera or the more expensive cameras can do these types of things. But as I was saying just before in the introduction, maybe before a few people joined along, it'd be interesting to know who who kind of regularly practices macro photography or considers it you know an, an area of interest to them. It'd be nice to know in the comments, um, you know, if you if you've been doing macro photography before, if it's something you're trying to get into, if you want to just refresh yourself, etc. It's nice to find out um, a little bit more about you all in terms of your macro photography interests. Um, so yeah, so in terms of the definition of macro photography, it's, it's basically shooting a subject at, li at life size in terms of what we refer to as a one-to-one -one ratio magnification. This basically means the, the object, the subject that you're photographing in the photo appears life size in the image. And I'll explain that maybe a little bit more clearly in a moment or two. Um, but with that said, you do get some people that mix genuine macro photography up with just a close-up so just generally kind of getting closer to an object than maybe they regularly would but I think there is a little bit of a difference and hopefully we'll show you with example images further on throughout this webinar you'll get a familiar idea as to what macro photography is I think there is a boundary where you can push your camera and your lens to the degree as to where it won't focus any closer obviously you're using specific macro equipment all these little things help you kind of get as close in as possible to really really deem it macro photography if you're just basically zooming in on a picture a little bit more um you know to blow it up a little bit bigger it doesn't necessarily constitute it being a macro i think there is there is special elements about it and specific equipment that will help you really achieve a true close-up oh hello ros and hello helen thank you so much for joining and don't worry you're not really that late at all we are yeah as jeff says <laughs> pretty much just at the start Right, okay, so let's get into a bit of the science of it here. I'm going to try and make this as easy as possible. If you've been through the iPhotography course, some of this will be familiar to you. And again, as I say, you can always watch the webinar back. You can even watch the course and that will help as well. Um, so magnification ratios are what lenses or macro lenses specifically uh, and used to determine the relative scale of how big your subject is. So a simple ratio of one to one that means a, an object, say if it was a, a wasp or a bee, you know, and it was maybe two or three inches long on the actual camera sensor on your image, when you've got your full size image, it would appear that two, three, two, three inch size. It would appear exactly how it is in real life. Now, 
With that said, magnification ratios can also change. It's not just one to one. Um, so you could go to five to one, which is effectively meaning the object of what you're photographing is five times larger on the sensor. And you can also go the opposite way around, one to five, meaning it's five times smaller. So it'll only be 20% of the size that it is actually in real life. But to be a true macro photograph, you need to have your subject at its one-to-one -one ratio. Anything outside of that, there will be some people that still consider it macro photography. I think a lot of the purists or maybe some more of the professionals, let's say, the people that do it day in, day out, they will say a one-to-one -one magnification ratio is really, really what you need. But with that said, you'll you'll see we'll go in talking about um, uh, camera lenses, macro lenses, and not all of them necessarily are straight up one-to-one -one magnification ratios. There's a way that you can change that. Um, but really, if you are wanting to kind of get the most accurate image, the, the best image quality, etc., um, this one-to-one -one magnification ratio is something we should be striving for. So going to put your maths hat on for a little bit. Who's good at mathematics? It'd be interesting to see. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not asking you answers for all these questions here, but let's start off. So if a one-to-one -one ratio displays your subject at 100% on the sensor, what are the following magnification ratio percentages? So I've got six questions here. I'm not expecting anybody to answer all of them. You can just pick one, throw your answer in the comments. You can just let me know which, which one you're answering, just whether it's A, B, C, D, or F. Um, I'm looking for the percentage. So I say one to one is 100%. So I'm looking for what is one to five, one to three, two to one. So read the ratios carefully because some of them are backwards to each other, but yeah. Just be interesting to kind of see. And it's something that kind of helps you stick in your head because not all macro lenses are natively one-to-one. -one. You will pick up some. If you've maybe got one at the minute, it may not be. But this gives you an understanding as to how much magnification is going on or how little magnification is going on um, with your image at the minute or with your lens, sorry, at the minute. Um, and it does help if you're looking to kind of buy a macro lens. Um, you know, it gives you better and understanding as to what you're actually looking for. So I'll give you a moment or two. You say you don't have to answer all of them. It's just for a little bit of fun. It just breaks things up slightly, makes it a bit more interactive. So yeah, if you just read the read the magnification ratios um, as they are, and we're talking about how to interpret them on the slide before. There's no prizes for this one, I'm afraid. <laughs> But I'd be, I'd be impressed if anybody gets all of them. I did have to double check a lot of my maths in this instance. It's been a long time since I've had to do that. Yet photography is absolutely bamboozled with maths in lots of different places. You don't kind of have to be a have to be a super brain for it. There's lots of calculators these days, especially for magnification ratios. Actually, there's quite a few websites that have, that have kind of calculators on um, them already. So let's refer back to our comments. Jackie, thank you so much for coming along. I really, really appreciate you coming along. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. I hope you're well. You've not really missed much. We were only just getting started and you can always scroll back and watch from the start. So we're getting a few mix cents. Yeah, a few mixes. Yeah, okay. I'm not going to be able to kind of check <laughs> what everybody's got and what everyone's saying. Right, let's move forward. Let's give you some kind of answers here and you can check it yourself. Uh, yeah, so a one to five would be 20%. A one to three, uh, that's B, is 33.3. .3. It's a third. Two to one would basically be 200%. Four to one, 400. One to four, 25%. And three to one, 300. So absolutely well done if anybody got those. I'm just flicking randomly back through the comments. Jay, and I can see you've got C correct. Well done. Uh, you got D correct. Um, yeah, Peter, you got yours right. Uh, Ian, F for 25, 300. Laurie, you spot on. Yeah, Deborah, you've got yours right, and I'm sure everybody else has got it. So the, the, the concept you understand, absolutely correct, yeah, so which is really, really good to see. Um, so yeah, it, it just helps a little bit more understand kind of how much of your subject is being magnified and how close it is to the actual size in real life based on when you see it in your, in your raw image. So when it actually kind of comes to camera choices in respect to which is best, you know, is there an answer? And unfortunately, there isn't, you know, ultimately what you're going to have to concentrate on and what we'll go into shortly 
is the lens. It's what you put in front of the camera is going to make the biggest difference, be it obviously the, any filters and accessories, but the lens itself. But ultimately, in terms of camera choices, there's very, very little difference. With that said, there is a slight advantage, more so with mirrorless cameras these days. Um, please, anybody shoot me down um, if they have this function on a DSLR because cameras change almost by the minute. So I wouldn't be surprised now if, if uh, things like focus peaking, um, if that has started to kind of come to DSLR cameras, maybe it's been there for a little while, then, then that'll be the advantage. So ultimately, um, mirrorless cameras have a feature called live focus peaking, which really, really helps you fine tune your focus when you're shooting manually, uh, in manual focus, that is not manual mode. Um, but yeah, it can kind of help you out a little bit more to give you a kind of a more clearer, more accurate understanding as to what is in focus, when your image is in focus and exactly where. So as you can see from the screen here, the back of the camera, where those little red markers are, this is what focus peaking does. It basically tells you with these little highlights what is in focus. So everything that's in red on that picture there will be sharp uh, and anything not will obviously be out of focus. And you can fine tune it a little bit more uh, by using the lens itself. So that's pretty much only where you would have a, a big advantage if you had a mirrorless and a DSLR. One had focus peaking, one didn't. That can be a little bit easier. There's also the added advantage that on mirrorless cameras, they sometimes have the option to magnify your live view. So obviously you can see what you can see on the screen, but it's always at 100%, but you can zoom in on mirrorless cameras to actually get in a little bit tighter. And then you can do the focus peaking uh, just to make sure it's absolutely perfect. So that is probably one advantage. I wouldn't be surprised if it's maybe in DSLR technology already. I don't believe it is. Um, but please tell me if I'm absolutely wrong because someone be, may have it in a DSLR uh, and that's absolutely fantastic. But if you're looking at using, you know, choosing between one or another for this type of purpose at the, mirror, at the minute, mirrorless technology would be better. And it's only going to get better. I think it's very much the future of uh, photography these days, not to say that DSLRs are dead and buried, but there certainly seems to be an upswing in it. Um, so Audrey, you're saying your, your Nikon D850 uh, does, but you haven't used it. There we go. Well, perfect. Strike me down. So there maybe is an advantage still to the DSLRs. Um, if it's got the magnification, the option to magnify um, the live view, that is, again, another added bonus as well. So yeah, fantastic. So Andy's saying it, it has on um, your Nikon as well. So brilliant. So those are the kind of little features that will really help you. And we'll get into kind of more camera settings as we go later on anyway. But otherwise, on the whole, there's not too much difference, I think, is what we're getting across. So don't bog yourself down as to whether this camera is better, that camera is better. Lenses, lenses is where it's down to, glass quality, etc. So which leads us on to our next session, best macro lens options. So the lens makes all the difference, as I was just saying, you know, if you're really looking to capture the best macro shots, investing in the best possible lens, the best optics, best glass, um, is a really wisest thing to do. Now, this is not me saying, you should all run out and going to buy some of these lenses here. This is really down to a case that if you're wanting to take it much more seriously, if you've got the the uh, the budget to do so, then definitely there's some great recommendations in here. Now, I'm not going to go through every lens because I think I've got about two, three or four slides of lenses here. This is something you can watch back afterwards and have a look because obviously I've tried to cover a few of the major brands, also some of the third party lenses as well. Um, and with each of them, as you can see from the screen here, I've obviously listed the, the, the lens and the model, um, what mounting is available for. Because obviously some of them say like this Canon one on the right hand side here is just for Canons, whereas the Tamron being a third party, it fits a number of different mounts. Um, so you just have to make sure you get the, the one that's correct for your lens. Um, also the type of kind of autofocus system it has, whether it has um, lens stabilization, which can be very, very useful uh, with macro photography when you're shooting at longer focal lengths. Um, and it also gives you what we call the MFD, um, the minimum focus distance. You'll see them labeled here and the magnification ratios. Um, so if you see one times, that is one to one. Okay, so it's just exp expressed slightly differently. We've been expressing them as ratios. Now they're here as multiples. So yeah, if you see 1.0, that means it's one to one. So there's a couple of examples there. Um, as I said, I'm not going to go through all of them. 
um, that's something for you guys to kind of have a look out for. But one thing you should be looking out for is lenses with a low MFD, minimal or minimum or minimal focus distance. This means how close you can physically get to your subject and be focused. Some, you know, sometimes it can be as, as little as a few centimeters, um, and that can make all the difference, really. But I say, well, we'll come and explain things like that a little bit later. So we've got a couple of other options here: a Sigma lens, they're really, really good. Um, Canon RF for mirrorless ones. Be interesting to know if anybody's got any of these lenses already. Oh, actually, there we go, straight away in the comments. Um, who is saying they've got the EF100? Laura, yes, you, you've got EF100, Tamron 90, uh, another Canon 100. Brilliant, there we go. So a nice mixture here. Yeah, so we've got another range of other ones for Fuji users, uh, Nikon, uh, the Z mount, so they're the mirrorless, uh, Nikon AF for um, uh, Nikon full frame i think they are is that the fx oh, i can't remember now <laughs> they've got so many variables and so many similar type name and mounts it's easy to get lost in there uh, there's an olympus one up at the top there for micro four third cameras like panasonics um etc so yeah you can always watch this back and pause etc i'm not going to bore people going through the the specifications of lenses etc but there you go another panasonic uh pentax and a sony the one thing that you'll see probably through quite a bit of this is that there's a variation of focal lengths and primarily pretty much all of them i think pretty much all of them are prime lenses as well none of them are, are zooms but saying that you you can get the odd one or two um zoom lenses that have macro functionality at the longer end but primarily most of these are prime lenses um so you, you can use them for other purposes but this is what they're designed for already thank you very much chris fx is full frame i thought it was i can't remember it's dx isn't it it's the crop sensor yeah why they just don't call it cx that would be a lot easier but anyway nikon so yeah feel free to watch that back over anyway guys if you want to have a little bit more information about that so what focal length is best really you know what what should you be choosing what should you be looking at what should you be shooting at now this is not to say what you are what you are shooting at, at the minute or the lens that you've got at the minute is wrong at all no one's saying that you can always do macro photography you just have to be conscious of the equipment that you've got and its capabilities and its limitations so um, like I said, you know, they, they are primarily fixed focal lengths, um, but you can get a few that are zoom. But the minimum focus distance is larger with zoom lenses or longer focal lengths. So this means you won't be able to get as close to your subject. It can be a little bit frustrating, but it gives us a bigger what we call a working distance, which I'll explain again a little bit later. But again, this could be kind of advantageous in a couple of different situations. Whereas shorter focal lengths, so something say 60 mil and below, um, they have a much shorter minimum distance. So it means you, you can kind of get closer in. You know, they require less light as the field of view is wider, but the working distance is greatly reduced. You're forced a lot closer and we'll explain uh, the disadvantages, potentially disadvantages to that in a moment so yeah just have a look at the graphics there so longer focal lengths they give you a narrower field of view so it means you don't see everything as widely you've got a shallower depth of field a longer working distance and a larger minimum focus distance so with shorter focal lengths so we're going to say that's around about 60 mil and shorter a wider field of view deeper depth of field wider depth of field whichever way you want to <laughs> whichever way you want to see it you know more more things in focus let's say just keep it simple um it also would give you a shorter working distance and therefore a shorter minimum focus distance so which should you choose which should you choose ultimately you know the, the choice is yours you know no one's ever going to say you have to have this lens and this lens only budget restraints and lots of the factors kind of come into it so it's it's unfair to necessarily kind of put that on people but if you are at the point of walking into the camera shop either money's no object or you've got a choice of a couple of different ones we would suggest and again it's always suggestions here it's up to you as to what you have at the end of the day you know a macro lens that covers somewhere between 300 and 100 mil it's not necessarily a zoom lens that covers 300 to 100 but i mean it could be um but otherwise a prime lens that falls somewhere in between that focal length and um, this is because the focal length has an effect on depth of field 
and macro photographers regularly do struggle to get the subject fully in focus um, when they're working in close quarters and sometimes that's down to uh, the lack of natural light depending upon what subject you're kind of photographing you could be potentially blocking the light itself because you are getting so close and so much on top of it so lenses with shorter focal lengths so as so we say kind of maybe less than 60 mil give uh, naturally a, um, a kind of a depth of field that's a little bit deeper which is ideal for macro photography so it's not to say just rush to the short end and just get something that's you know under 60 mil um, there are advantages to going a little bit longer so it's up to you but I think if we give you all the information it's down to you to kind of make that judgment as to what's best for you or at least understand what's best but as I said on the flip side of it that with uh, with a short focal length you'll need to get closer to your subject so like I probably just said just before you could end up blocking the light itself and you will need some form of light whether it's via a flash or a, a constant light that you bring in to compensate but ultimately, you know, if you are a total beginner, you're not ready to splash out on a big new macro lens, we've got alternatives that we're going to go into shortly, uh, be it macro lens filters and extension tubes. Because a few people have been talking about this today. Um, I think we had a daily question, which is kind of quite well timed, um, working around or talking around the uses of extension tubes. So let's have a look at them for a minute. Yeah, again, keep feel free to throw in any questions, uh, anything you're unsure about in the comments. Honestly, don't feel that you should hold back from any questions. If you've got us, you want to ask something, please do ask it um, because you never know. You may be helping out somebody else that's maybe a little bit nervous just to ask. So putting your hand up is the best thing. Um, right. <laughs> yeah, Joe, you're right. <laughs> so many choices, so little money. <laughs> nope. Always the same, especially with photography. Why do we pick the most expensive hobby possibly to have? Right, let's go on to extension tubes. I say a few people have asked me a few questions about this today and in previous days. So we've got a few slides that are hopefully going to clear things up. So extension tubes are effectively spaces that, that, that sit between your lens and the camera body. So they attach to the back of the lens and obviously then the other parts of it attach to the camera body itself. So it extends physically the length of the lens and it alters what we call, I think I've mentioned before, the MFD, the minimum focus distance. The MFD of a lens is the measurement of the closest point of a subject it can be from the camera sensor while still being able to focus. If your subject is closer to the camera sensor uh, than a lens's minimum focus distance, you will not achieve focus. Someone, and I can't remember, I apologize for names, had mentioned um, potentially this may be a why um, or uh, was mentioning they were struggling using extension tubes and their macro lens. And I think their macro lens was an 100 mil lens. And what could be happening is that the minimum distance, the minimum focus distance on that lens could be maybe three or four, let's say just for argument's sake, three or four centimeters. So you can get that close. If you add an extension tube that's maybe five or six centimeters thick, it means the minimum focus distance is actually kind of within the lens itself. So the lens can't internally focus on what's in, what's in front of you because the focal point, the minimum focus distance has already been achieved in lens, if that makes sense. So you'll just need to scrap the uh, extension tube. So it's it's not for everybody. This is only going to depend upon the combination of lens and extension tubes. But I don't think if you've got a prime, you know, really, really good um, macro lens, you're maybe going to need these anyway. These are opportunities that, you know, if somebody's trying to get into macro photography and they're just going to use a kit lens or something like that, it allows that opportunity there as well. So I possibly wouldn't combine a dedicated macro with an extension tube straight away. Or if you are having problems with using that combination, you're not getting focus, it could be because of the MFD. Um, so yeah, so the MFD, uh, I think it's like I said, it's a measurement basically of where the closest point of the subject can be from the sensors while still being able to focus. There's just a little recap on that one there. Now, again, don't worry too much upon the, um, the mathematics to all of this. Sometimes, you know, if you like to know these things, you like to know these things, feel free to, to skip over this if you watch back later on. But if you want to work out how much more magnification your extension tube is giving you, there is a little equation. Now, this could be useful because there are macro lenses out there that aren't a one to one ratio. And if you want to achieve that, combining it with an extension tube can help.
So what you need to take is currently what your lens's magnification ratio is, um, and then add that to basically a, um, a, what's the word, a sum of the extension amount, basically how the, the focal length of it, what it is, um, and kind of divide that by the focal length and it gets you a new magnification. So let me just kind of take you as an example here, 50 mil lens at 1.8, um, and if it has a, what effectively is like a, a one to five, pardon me, a one to five magnification ratio, when combined with a 12 mil extension tube on it, then we get a new sum. So the sum effectively works out on screen here, which is 0 0.21, which is the lens's native, let's say magnification. Um, but beforehand, you have to do a little division, which is 12 divided by 50, which would have been the extension amount, which is the 12 mil. Um, and the focal length, which is 50 mil. And this now gives us a 0 0.45 um, magnification. So we've effectively doubled it, just over doubled the magnification. So we've gone from one to five to one to 2.5, if you see what I mean. Um, so it does help. You know, so the problem ultimately is that the, the minimum focus distance is a measurement from the camera's sensor and not from the front of the lens. So this means that the longer that the longer prime and zoom lenses means well let me just restart that i think this will recapping what we were saying before about being able to accidentally end up with um an extension tube and a long focal length means you may, you may not necessarily get your photograph sharp because the focus distance ends actually inside the lens itself. So it's a little bit of mathematics there and please don't feel like you know you, you need to learn things like that. Some people really, really enjoy that. So feel free to kind of recap with the slide. You can go back over it again as many times as you want after the webinar itself. But that just kind of helps you understand how much more magnification you're going to get. So if you are wanting to combine like a kit lens with uh, extension tubes, it's good to know kind of how much more closely you're getting in. But as I said, sometimes with longer prime lenses and zoom lenses, using these extension tubes may not always work. So maybe yeah, kind of kick off with a, a shorter lens to begin with if you've got one. Um, so yeah, so yeah, just this is kind of like just a little re recap effectively of what they are, but this is how you see them down on the screen here. You, they come in various sizes. Um, and as you can actually see here, you can kind of pile them up on top of each other. You can use just one extension tube at a time. And I would probably go down that route. So even though you can buy them in sets, um, I wouldn't necessarily pile them all on top of each other to begin with and then attach the lens. I'd just start off with the smallest one. So on screen here, there's a 12 mil bolt that onto the back of your lens and the camera, see what level of magnification you're getting. If you can kind of keep your image sharp while they've got it on, brilliant. Maybe take it off, try the next one and see how close you can get and still make sure you're getting sharp images. Um, and then if you want to start bolting two and then three on together, can do, but you've got to just do a test. So, you know, I think there's a little bit of, of homework before you go racing into the field uh, with doing this anyway. Um, the one thing you do need to be kind of cautious of is that extension tubes are very, very notorious for light loss. Um, they, they may require you to open your aperture a little bit further. They may require you to bump your ISO or slow your shutter speed down, etc. Um, so to kind of get, help you with that a little bit, shooting in manual mode will be very, very useful. Now I'll go on to the types of extension tubes that you can get um, because not all of them will necessarily allow you to change the camera settings once they're physically attached because some of them don't have electronic communicators between basically on the extension tube so the camera can't talk to the actual lens itself. You've put something in between that has no electronic communication. Um, so you may need to kind of set all your camera settings up first, keep it in manual and then put your extension tubes on so nothing changes. So yeah, they are very, very useful, um, but they're not for everybody. So here we go. So extension tubes are best used on lenses between 30 to 60 mil. So as we were saying before, the longer focal lengths aren't really ideal for that because we may be surpassing the MFD. Um, but and as we were saying a little bit earlier, I managed to kind of uh, speak over myself a little bit <laughs> in terms of like giving you information for the, the, the following slides. Um, so yeah, so sorry, where am I? Yeah, basically some of them don't have electronic controls in them on the extension tubes themselves. Um, cheaper ones, obviously the cheaper that you go, you get what you pay for really with them. Um, so yeah, so I'm gonna go into, I think it's like three different types of extension tubes that you can get. 
um, yeah, here we go. Okay, so it's the three different types of extension tubes that you can get. And here's an example image on one side. This is something I took oh, a while ago, really. This is using a 30 mil macro lens. So it's a dedicated macro lens, but then with the added an extension tube on top. So it does kind of get you kind of fairly close in. Um, there is an issue, you know, your your uh, amount of area of focus that you can get on your image does kind of decrease a little bit more, um, but it can still give you an interesting kind of quality, uh, good quality image and not necessarily expensive either, the set that I bought. So the, the three sets that we've got here, the first one uh, called the OEM extension tubes, these are basically the ones that you would get from your camera manufacturer. So if you had uh, a Canon camera, this these would be kind of the extension tubes that come from Canon. So they are designed to work with Canon lenses and Canon cameras. They have full autofocus capabilities. They have full electronic capabilities. So if you bolt one of these OEM extension tubes onto a lens, a Canon lens and a Canon body, they will all talk to each other. So you'll be able to change your camera settings in there and everything like that as well. So those are the kind of the better ones. If you're going to add, you know, go in kind of full into this um, and they are going to be a little bit more expensive. Second type kind of next here down is a third party extension tube. So they'll be the ones that are made by manufacturers that maybe don't make cameras themselves. Maybe you don't even make lenses necessarily, um, uh, but they will have autofocus capabilities. And then the third ones, the bottom of the tier, the ones that you get from wish.com. <laughs> <laughs> these are the third party extension tubes the ones that i've got um and they don't come with autofocus so you will just have to use manual focus on the lens itself there is no communication like i was saying before between the camera and the lens so you will have to basically preset everything to begin with um so you'll have to kind of plug in all your settings kind of on your camera maybe even when the lens attached first make sure um, everything was looking good take your lens off put the extension tubes on put the lens back on so let me just jump back into the comments just in case I've missed any questions because there was quite a bit that we went through there. Um, <laughs> it's it kind of quite heavy stuff. It is, um, but like, let me say, I'm not saying all of this necessarily needs to be memorized. A, now, it doesn't. And if if you're not, especially if you're kind of not going to get into the area of extension tubes, you don't need to know about it. You know, just focus on the things that you, you need to learn. If you've not got extension tubes, not you don't feel that you're necessarily ever going to need them don't worry so much and again you know not everything in here is just aimed that you all have to learn at the same time um you know some people are interested in certain things some aren't so don't worry it may seem a little bit heavy with the mathematics that's photography unfortunately i'm sure you'll all have the uh the joys of working with nd filters and things like that and um crop factors etc all the other different kind of areas of mathematics you can get in photography but yeah don't don't feel that you need to kind of be absorbing all this information uh, straight away it's just very very useful to know <clears throat> if you're looking at buying a lens um you know if you want to know a little bit more about the equipment that you've got and how it'll be changing your shop it's all there for you <laughs> a glass of wine <laughs> That'll only make things worse. <laughs> right, let's move forward. So let's look at another alternative option. So if you're not interested in, or um, not interested in getting a macro lens, that's not in your future, um, not even extension tubes, let's look at macro lens filters. Are they worth it? I don't know if anybody's got any of these. I've got a set myself and I had tried some out um, in comparison to extension tubes. Um, I wasn't completely satisfied with them. Maybe I wasn't using them exactly in the right conditions. Uh, at the time, I was just kind of hurrying through them as a test. But in comparison, if I was choosing between the uh, macro filters and extension tubes, I'd have gone with the tubes. Uh, but either way, let's not be, let me stop anybody from exploring this because they could be a very, very good entry level option. They are much more budget friendly than, like I said, splashing out on um, an actual macro lens itself. Almost comparative, I would say, in terms of pricing, depend where you go to. If we just went to Amazon, as most, <laughs> most of us do these days, um, I would say macro lens filters and extension tubes, you could probably end up about the same price depending upon the level of quality that you want. So I don't think there's much difference here, but these filters are fixed in the exact same way as an ND or a graduated filter, just screw it onto the front of your lens and you can go through a variation of magnification uh, levels from one to 10. Um, so obviously the, the higher the magnification ratio, the 
bigger the magnification is going to be. Um, now, because it's all done by the glass and the optics, depending upon the quality, it really, really does determine how good an image you'll come out at the back end. Very, very cheap macro filters and slightly more expensive macro filters, let's say, will have a difference in quality. It's all down to the glass. It's all down to the optics, really. But the options are there. They're fun to play around with. You know, if, you, if you're just wanting to experiment, get yourself a cheap set, see how it works out. And obviously, it, it's just about kind of trying it out. May not be for you, but that's fine. You've not spent a lot of money necessarily in, in exploring that. It's better option, you know, if you are a completely beginner to macro photography to, uh, to kind of maybe start at this level and then work your way up if you enjoy it. And yeah, I, Laura has a point. Macro filters, um, you can get you can get them for iPhones, you can get them for all types of smartphones, uh, clip-on lenses. Um, I think if anybody is up to, oh, you'll have to remind me now, I think it's about less than 16 or 17 on skill tracks. Um, there is a lesson about macro photography that Emily leads in there. Um, and she basically demonstrates, I think it's Sandmark um, uh, clip-on macro lenses. Uh, very, very good quality on that one as well. So yeah, if you if you kind of um, have the opportunity to check out one of those skill track lessons, if you're up to that, please do so. That's got a little bit more information in there about macro photography uh, on smartphones. So you can, when I said, once you've got your macro filters, they, they do come in sets of very similar to the extension tubes. You can use one on its own. You can add more and more and more. The example image here where it's got a plus 10, a plus 4, a 2 and a 1, it's insane. You will literally have to be touching your subject if you're using that many of them. They are These level of magnification, especially a plus 10, is crazy. It's really close. You'll get almost a microscopic view, but the quality may not necessarily be there. So again, like with the extension tubes, start off with a plus 1, see how it works, then try a 2, then you can add more on top of them, et cetera, et cetera. And a couple of images here um, that I'd taken, these ones that I'd taken with the close-up filters. So you can see the depth of field obviously is massively reduced. You've just got a very, very small portion of your image that is sharp. And it's just, I would say it's on the borderline of being acceptably sharp. I think this was maybe only a plus one, possibly a plus two. Uh, so you can see how close you can get already in these instances. Um, but yeah, they're very kind of quick, they're easy to use. They go on, obviously any lens, providing you've got the right, um, uh, the right uh, thread size. Um, but yeah, you can fit them to kind of all lenses. Uh, you don't necessarily have to have, you know, a branded version, etc. but it's a good way to kind of get into it. Um, question from Kaya, what's the best focal length to use when trying to photograph a poisonous creature? Uh, that can be, oh, well, actually, this is going to be a kind of a good question to answer. I think we've got it coming up in a moment. Let me just see if I have or not. No, I have. I've, I will be able to give you the answer shortly because it relates to what we call working distance. So I'll try and remember to come back to this question in a short while. We have maybe slightly answered it. Um, but I will go back through it again um, because there is there's benefits to working distance, which very much would answer this type of question. But quickly, just in terms of auto and manual focus, which is best, you may have an understanding already based on what we've been talking about. Um, but really, a lot of detail is really what you're looking to achieve in macro photography. If you think about shooting very, very small objects, the, the essence of what you're trying to capture is a detail that people would otherwise normally overlook. Something like a butterfly or, or a flower or whether it be a poisonous creature. So, you know, something that is very small that, you know, ideally you want to be able to kind of show off that detail of. Um, this is why getting your image as sharp is absolutely key. And because you are working in such close proximity, depending upon the lens, but generally you're a lot closer than normal. Autofocus can sometimes be a little bit harder. If you're working in close proximity, you're blocking out natural light, whether you're just in an environment, maybe like a woodland, for example, where there isn't a lot of natural light, the lens may be, um, the autofocus may be hunting to kind of keep the image sharp. It may be kind of hunting for an edge that it can find to make it sharp, which can be very tricky. It can be frustrating. If you're photographing animals, that little creature may have tittered off somewhere. Um, and you've missed focus. So what we would generally say is manual focus. <clears throat> Most professional macro photographers tend to recommend using manual focus and they'll have a little bit more success. Like we said earlier, if you couple this up with a mirrorless camera, with having the focus peaking, the live view magnification, it makes it a lot easier. Um, so yeah, so we would recommend manual focus. It can take a little bit of time, not too much more, but obviously if you're 
Um, if you're used to using autofocus all the time, you know, it can just take a little couple of seconds or so, not, you know, not talking ages, but if you just take that little bit of extra time, if you're photographing something like flowers, you know, you've got a little bit of time, they're not going to wander off in the same way as like an insect. Um, but it certainly will pay dividends because you can get that better level of sharpness. And sometimes you may be able to get it actually a little bit quicker than autofocus if it's just hunting around and it's not able to find a, a clean edge to focus on if you're working in low light. <coughs> so there's one little kind of technique some macro photographers can use, and this may sound really, really odd, and I don't necessarily want to act it out, but I couldn't really kind of find a video, um, and I didn't have the opportunity to film myself necessarily doing it, um, on how they set the focus. But effectively, they use manual focus, and they set all the exposure, so basically everything's set in camera, so everything's correct. And all they do is with their finger, uh, their finger's kind of on the front of the lens, basically twisting the lens to kind of achieve manual focus, they rock forwards and backwards ever so slightly whilst watching the screen or looking through the viewfinder, waiting either for those focus peaking lines to appear uh, to, to know when they're sharp, or they're just judging it by eye if they're not using that fit, that feature. But it's effectively like a short, they wrap, they liken it to holding a baby, a, new, uh, a newborn baby, they just rock slowly forwards and backwards and they're just watching the subject, watching when the important aspect, whether it be the eyes or the edge of the petal or whatever in these instances, is completely sharp, and that's when they take their shot. So it's not standing still, it's just that slowly forwards and backwards rocking motion. And that's simply because if you're working with insects, for example, they can be moving, and their slight minute movements can affect focus if you're working with a very shallow depth of field. Same with flowers, as much as they're not necessarily moving around like animals, they're subject to wind. They can be moving themselves a little bit, being blown around. So just to make sure, you know, photographers, as opposed to waiting for one point and waiting for the flower or the, the insect to move into that area, they're just trying to kind of compensate, try and get as many shots as possible by moving them forwards and backwards themselves. So it may feel a little bit odd and it's a bit of a strain on the back, but it's just a bit of a, a technique that uh, macro photographers use that could be kind of quite useful. So let's move on to tripod and handheld. Um, actually, there's Peter, you, you mentioned, I just saw the word handheld there in your comments and you need to shoot handheld uh, and use continuous focus and burst mode, but that can be very, very useful. Obviously, if you're photographing insects and you never know how long they're gonna stay, burst mode can be very, very useful uh, in itself. Um, but yeah, it'd be interesting to see if you've ever tried manual focus at the same time if you've, uh, if you've kind of had success with that, or maybe it's something to think about going forwards. Um, and ultimately, there really is that there's not a perfect scenario where to say you should only use tripod or you should only shoot handheld. It depends upon you know what you're shooting to some degree, um, you know how much flexibility necessarily that you want. If you've got shaky hands, you know some people do, I do. You know if you've got heavy cameras, holding them for a long time, especially with a long lens, if you've got a big prime lens, prime macro lens, this can all be quite heavy. And if you're if you're working with a very very shallow depth of field and manual focus at the same time, moving the camera around and everything like that you could lose focus quite easily. So a tripod could be very, very useful for that. But sometimes people like the flexibility in being able to shoot handheld so they can physically, like I said before, just move forwards and backwards. So there's no perfect scenario. You can shoot macro photography both ways. I've, I've watched tons of videos where some photographers do it handheld and they almost seem to be doing it in a very kind of loose and candid way. I know there's maybe like the images here, people take a little bit more time, they set things up very specifically on a tripod. It really depends partly on your kit as to what equipment that you've got, you know, how comfortable you are holding that kit for sometimes a couple of seconds at a time and trying to keep as still as possible. Sometimes uh, macro photographers will kind of breathe a bit more slowly or pay more attention to their breathing and they will literally take the shots when they kind of give an out breath as opposed to when they breathe in because that's when the body vibrates a little bit more. So it's just about those small fine margins. It's very surprising how, how all these little techniques can kind of add up and help you achieve a better image. Um, mentioned a couple of times the phrase working distance. Let's kind of explain what it is here. Um, because there are benefits to it, the, the things that will work with you and against you in terms of working distance. And this may answer uh, Joe's, Joe's question before about the poisonous creature. Um, but working distance is the distance between the front of your lens and your subjects. Um, this will be determined by your minimum focus distance, ultimately how close you can get. Um, 
hopefully with the image here, I've tried to illustrate, because some people do use lens hoods, flower hoods, whatever you want to call them, um, in their photography or macro photography. The working distance does not include that. It's from the front of your lens, so the, the actual glass, the front optic there to the object itself, like the nearest point of your object there. So whether you put a lens hood on there or anything like that, the working distance isn't increased or it doesn't include that. So you just work past it. So lenses with a shorter focal length. So let's go back to our example earlier. We talked about 60 mil and shorter. They have a small working distance, meaning you'll be quite close to your subject. Longer lenses have a larger working distance. So to answer Joe's question a little bit earlier about the poisonous creature, ideally, a longer focal length, so something 80 mil upwards, 100 mil upwards, would be better for such type of creature because you can have a bigger working distance so you can get a little bit further away from that subject there. So hopefully that kind of answers that a little bit, but I just wanted to put it into context as opposed to me just saying this lens, so explaining why. Um, okay, just kind of elaborate on that a little bit further. Um, a large working distance is useful, pretty much exactly what I'm just going to be answering uh, from what we've been saying already, Joe, um, about kind of obviously kind of keeping away from dangerous animals, if you're photographing bees or something like that, something you don't want to get physically close to. Um, those are kind of quite useful. And also on the basis of natural light, as we were saying before, if you got really, really close into your subject, you could be blocking light that's coming in from behind you if the sun is behind you or to the side. If you've got a larger working distance, you can get a little bit further away. And sometimes that light can kind of wrap around you a little bit more. With um, having a shorter, a smaller, shorter working distance, it can have its benefits because with those type of lenses that give you a shorter working distance, gives you a greater depth of field. So more, more of your object can be in focus. It's a swing and roundabout. It is a catch-22 situation as to which is best. Ultimately, they both provide benefits. They both maybe have negatives in a way. Sometimes you want to get a little bit closer. You obviously want more of your object in focus. So you would think, great, something with a bigger depth of field is brilliant, but it means you have to get really close. Then if you want a larger working distance, you have a much smaller depth of field. So you're only going to get a smaller portion in focus in comparison. So pros and cons, it's a tricky kind of thing to kind of balance out really. But at least if you understand all the mechanics and what's going on, you can make decisions from there. So hopefully that answers the question, Joe, um, about your poisonous creature. What is it you're actually photographing? I'm, I'm intrigued now. Right, uh, okay, let's move forward about how to set the exposure for macro photography. Um, so you can treat this effectively like any other type of photography. Keeping your eye on things like your exposure scale. So as you would see them up here, this is the top example and the middle example. That's your exposure scale. You'll see it on the back of your camera or on the top readout, depending upon what type of camera you've got trying to keep that scale at the zero marker um, or if you use a histogram use it typically as you would to avoid any kind of clipping on the highlights and the shadows etc um, so ideally the iso should be kind of kept as low as possible to help retain color and give you better detail the higher and higher you raise iso i appreciate it could be to benefit the exposure um, but it does have negative effects obviously bringing in noise but the noisier your image gets um, the less detail it has and it breaks up color. And obviously you want to retain all that color and detail. So keeping the ISO as low as possible is a very, very good thing. Um, so to kind of help with that, if you don't want to have to raise the ISO, a flash can be very, very useful, which will come into shortly. Um, but if you are using a flash, then you will be limited as to how quick your shutter speed can go because obviously the two have to be synced up together. So depending upon your camera, depending on the flash, between 160th of a second to 250th of a second is normally a, what we call a, a flash sync speed. Um, I said the, the the higher end cameras and the higher end flash, sometimes you can go that little bit higher. Um, but typically for most users, between 160th, 125th is about as fast as it can go. Um, so you're going to be limited a little bit in that respect as to kind of where you can change your shutter speed. Um, but if you're using a flash, you shouldn't really need to. That should give you enough light itself. Um, and shooting in manual mode will give you the best control, obviously, over the exposure. Depending upon where you are shooting, if you're outdoors, if the light may be changing a little bit, you can be kind of adjusting your aperture as you go. Um, so yeah, so really the, there isn't one 
one set of um, camera settings that you would need. Obviously, it's just these aspects you always need to be kind of paying attention to. Um, but as I said, a flash can be very, very useful when it comes to macro photography if you're working in kind of close quarters. Um, to uh, use an exposure mode that puts the emphasis on the subject. So I mean exposure mode, not necessarily in the camera dial settings like manual aperture, um, the actual exposure metering mode, I suppose I should kind of maybe add the word metering in there. Um, because you'll probably see from your camera, there's a number of different metering modes in the way that the actual camera itself reads the incoming light. Um, so something that focuses more specifically on your subject, be it spot, uh, spot exposure metering or center weighted, because that's kind of putting all the emphasis on the middle um, of the actual exposure. And given that your subject most of the time will probably be kind of fairly central, you're going to want to make sure that all the exposure is being read from them and not so much from the surrounding on the outside. It's all about kind of capturing the amount of the right amount of light, and the right amount of detail on your subject. So a spot or center weighted uh, exposure mode will probably be the best option. Um, when you choose your aperture, remember how it affects your depth of field, as we said a little bit earlier. Wider apertures give a shallow depth of field, uh, which so we can cut out parts in terms of how much of your subject is in focus. That depends on what you want the final image to be and how much of it you want to be in focus. Um, but really, typically, macro photographers, they would shoot somewhere in between f6 and f11. They don't necessarily just use the widest point possible. Um, and that's effectively because a lot of them use flash. Um, you know, if they're not using a the flash, they may be using a very, very bright light anyway, but a lot of them do use flash. Um, so they don't necessarily need to go super wide in terms of their aperture. They can stay around about you know, F8, F11, somewhere like that. And they basically let the flash provide the, um, the, added, the added brightness for the exposure. So they, you don't necessarily need to kind of go really wide. If you aren't using flash though, it would be understandably so you may need to open your aperture a little bit further but it's certainly worth considering using a flash and i'll explain again a little bit more about that um but going in the opposite direction can give you negative kind of attributes in terms of kind of making your aperture smaller you can end up with uh, elements of diffraction and this is when the light rays aren't meeting all at the same point so you may not get your image as super sharp as possible um, so don't feel that it's a case of using the smallest aperture will give me a greater depth of field more detail etc etc depth of field and sharpness aren't necessarily directly combined because otherwise everybody would just shoot at f22 and that's not so much the point um, so yeah i would say somewhere between f f5.6 f11 if you're using flash otherwise you may just need to adjust that based upon the exposure itself of what you're getting if you're using uh, natural light um, but let's move into flash because it's not just a direct flash that we're going to be talking about so uh, an off-camera flash can be very very useful because the pop-up if you've got like a pop-up flash on your camera or sometimes the old built-in ones they're generally quite small quite limited they're very very direct they just obviously kind of point in one direction unless they're being bounced um, but an off-camera flash would be it would be better it would give you a lot more flexibility um, I mean, you can get flashes anywhere. You can go to your own camera manufacturer, you can get a Canon or a Nikon flash, but even third party ones, by the by, uh, Mica, Newer, Godox, these are really good uh, flash manufacturers and they're not, in comparison, they're not that expensive. Quality wise, they're very, very good. Obviously, just make sure it's compatible with your camera. And if you're using it off camera itself, if you're using it remotely, um, you'll need to get a trigger. So that's one that sits on the top of your camera's hot shoe. Um, and then you'll have your other part that attaches, we call the slave, um, the receiver to the bottom of the flash. Um, so wherever you're using the two of them, camera and flash, they will talk to each other. Um, so yeah, you'll need one of those. Sometimes you can actually get a, a wire that goes between the two. It's a bit old school. It's all wireless these days, isn't it? Um, so when it comes to setting the uh, exposure power or the, the power itself for the flash, start off around about quarter, um, you can move up to a sixteenth, just do some test shots, just kind of see what works. You can see a little example here of um, two insects, one shot with direct flash, one with diffuse flash, because we'll come to the actual light quality in a second, because direct flash can be very, very hard, as you know, if you've ever used a pop-up flash. 
It can leave heavy shadows behind your subject, depending upon the direction it's actually coming from, which you name necessarily not once. You may find it's distracting um, and it may be a little bit too harsh. You see in the way that it's it's kind of costing a bit of detail in the wings of the insect here, whereas the diffuse flash is the he the shadow is on, it's heavy, and you can see, or at least I can see, I don't know if you can see on the stream because <laughs> of the quality of it all, but you can see like the fine hairs uh, and the detail on the back of the insect here. So diffusing your flash, softening the flash um, is very, very advantageous. Um, so before you start into shooting, like we said, covering the flash in one manner or form can be very, very useful. It could be something as simple as one of these uh, flash covers here. Um, <laughs> They do look quite odd. You can do them in so many different ways. I've even seen like DIY versions uh, where you get like a milk carton and put it over the flash itself. As long as it's translucent in a similar way that it is here, it will basically kind of filter out the light, soften it and spread it out further so you end up with less heavy shadows. Obviously, if you want to take things a bit more seriously, you can invest in an actual proper um, diffuser like it is here. And I think I've got a couple on the next page as well. So this is going to help spread the light out a little bit further and um, still kind of give you a good exposure, but not end up with those heavy shadows. And plus, especially if you're shooting with insects, it's maybe you're not going to startle them as much as you get really, really close up to them and then setting off a giant flash in their face as it would if it were a person. Having a slightly more softer diffuse the flash um, would just be a little bit more flattering or greatly more received anyway. <laughs> Um, so here are a couple more examples. Um, some macro photographers do also use these LED ring lights. You can put little diffuser filters on the front of them to do the same thing. These are really, really good because you can get super close up and because some of them actually have continuous lights on, like this example here, you can kind of pretty much see your illumination as it is there. Some of them aren't even flashes. Some of them are just constant lights, um, so they don't flash itself. And that just allows you to kind of see exactly how bright the exposure is based on the back of the uh, camera itself. So they're very, very useful. The one on the left side here um, uses, I think it's called a, yeah, a, a diffuser globe or a, a global light, some people, some people call them. And that's basically like a big orb that just attaches right to the end of an off-camera flash and it spreads the light all around. Obviously, some of the light will be lost above and behind you, um, but it does that purposely to be able to spread the light kind of quite evenly um, and it doesn't end up with those harsh shadows. So there are a couple of different options and different ways of diffusing flashes. It's up to you what you like. Um, you know, if, if you've got the budget, you can try them all out, etc. They're not necessarily that expensive. Obviously, the, the quality of them can go up and down, but to begin with at a starter level, they're not necessarily that expensive, just depending on where you go. Um, but I'd say you'd be able to have a look on Amazon for 99 or if not 100% of these products that would be going, going on about. Um, but yeah, ultimately, they're very, very useful for macro photography. Um, right, let me just jump back into the comments. So I Apologize if I've missed anything in there. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. Oh, it was poisonous snakes and frogs. Yes, or certainly, yeah, you don't want to be touching anything like that. So, yeah, your uh, longer focal length, so longer lenses give you that bigger working distance. You can get back a little bit further from them. So, very, very useful for that there, um, Kaya. Hopefully, that helps. Um, so, Raj is saying apparently you can get close to a subject as it is, although not true macro. It's as close. Can you get close to that? Sorry, I think I'm a little bit lost in that, that comment there. Maybe related to something else further on. I apologise. I've gone through so much. <laughs> I'm coming back to it a little bit later here. Um, yeah, yeah. Noya is a very, very good brand. Yeah, Laura, you've mentioned they're not that expensive. And then they're, they're, they're fairly decent, as I say. If, this is, if you are a beginner, you're just kind of considering getting into macro photography, you want to try it out. These third-party brands, they make some good equipment, even from lenses, extension tubes, filters, the flashes. You can get it all there for a fairly decent price if you want to get the whole kind of kit and caboodle um, but certainly flashes are going to help the most in terms of the quality if you're not using a dedicated macro lens if you're going to be using macro filters and extension tubes i'd get a good flash um, if you're going to get a good prime lens a good prime macro lens you can maybe get away with a slightly cheaper light um, to help alongside because the two will almost help balance them out a little bit but ultimately if you're all about raising your game the, the better quality products and equipment that you have will always help you. Um, righty ho, so let's move forwards. We're going to talk about where to focus your photos. So this is kind of a fairly short uh, little section here because it depends on the subject that you're photographing as to where to focus. But 
if we just ran with the argument that most people would photograph insects, small animals, just like Joe was saying before, and florals, they're probably the two most popular areas of macro photography. With insects, especially whether they're facing towards you or even if they're side on, it's the eye. Treat it like a portrait. The eyes are absolute king. That is the area that you're going to be wanting to focus on all the time. Look at the edges of their eye. If you can kind of see a crisp, a crisp contrast. So take, for example, this middle image here of the fly. The focus area would have been put either. Um, well, it probably looks more likely that it's the inside of the eye between where this red eye is and where it goes white. Um, you could otherwise argumentatively say between the outside of the eye and the background there. Um, but ultimately, the eye itself is the center of where you should be looking at. Um, same again, if it's side on, you should be looking for an area of contrast, which is normally around about the eyelids. Again, it depends on what animal and, and how much of the eye you can see and how close you can, you can get. But really, if you kind of got the option of putting your focus point anywhere specifically, pop it on the eye. That's the main thing it should go for. With flowers, it's a little bit different, obviously, um, but you should be considering about placing it in the center of the flower. Now, obviously, it all depends upon the composition that you're going for. Um, so if it's actually being included, then really the center of the flower would naturally draw you in either the, the stamen or the stigma. I think those are two areas within the center of most flowers. Um, Generally, the shaping of flowers draw you in towards that center point. It has this kind of natural composition that draw you into the middle. So that's really where you should be looking to place your focus point. Um, now, but if your focal, uh, if your floral image doesn't actually feature the center of your flower, then you should just be looking for a dominant edge, the most dominant edge of any of the petals. Maybe more so the ones that are closer to you. It all depends about the composition, but think about the edge of the petals. It's going to be a lot easier to get focus because if there's another petal behind, it may be a little bit lighter, maybe a bit darker, but it will help the camera have a clear edge to work with. And that's where autofocus is very, very, um, that's what autofocus helps or works. What's the best phrase to put this is? This is what autofocus looks for, is contrast, is uh, kind of clear edges. Manual focus will help as well, obviously being using things like uh, focus peaking, as we talked about before. Um, but the, the beauty of florals is that you've got the time. You, you've got the time to kind of work with slowly and actually kind of play around with a few different ideas anyway. So ultimately, yeah, it depends on what you're shooting. But if it's insects, work with the eye. If it's uh, flowers, go for the center. If the center's not there in the shot, then look for a clear edge on the petals. So... We are just going to wrap up We're a couple of minutes over. I apologize, but some of these slides take a little bit longer to explain. I appreciate everybody that's, that's stuck along so far because I think kind of a few of you have had to leave. It's absolutely fine. We're going to have a look at some of these amazing images that you guys have been sending in. Uh, and I hope you've enjoyed the webinar. Hopefully it's been very, very useful to give you a bit of information. Say so feel free to read back over this, have a look at any more information and read through the slides. That sometimes may be a little bit of a better uh, explanation than sometimes me rambling on so you can watch it and press mute at the same time. Um, so there's lovely images here sent in by Catherine Lawson, one from Andrea Gully. I think we've got a couple of others on the next page, one from Laura Harrison, uh, Deborah McPhail. These are beautiful examples. Um, I think some of these I've seen in the gallery before, so you may be able to actually have a look for these if you if you go into the individual's profile there. Um, and a couple of other cracking images. This is a great one for Peter. So you can see that eye is absolutely pin sharp on the really, really nice kind of depth of field, but lots of lovely detail in that. And that's really what you want to capture. Capture. And same again with Marsha, focus right in towards the center of the flower itself. That's where your eye is being drawn. So thank you so much, guys, for, for sending those images in. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, and a lovely one from Jane to finish off at the end. Again, another great example, focusing right into the center of the flower on those stamen and stigmas. So um, if anybody wants to have a read a little bit more, I've talked have got some great blogs, uh, Macro Photography Complete Guide for Beginners, and another one about capturing maize and macros. So you can check out those on our blog page. Um, it was lesson 16. I knew I'd written it somewhere. Um, yeah, if you're up to um, lesson 16 on our skill tracks, then have a look at that one there. It gives you a little bit more information um, and some examples of working with macro on mobile phones, which is very useful. Um, and as we don't have a full video tutorial yet, there is one that I would recommend. I wouldn't normally recommend kind of outside <laughs> videos uh, on YouTube, but this is one that I, I've watched a couple of times. So, um, yeah, kind of a couple of times in the past few weeks or so. Um, 
which I would recommend. It's called Introduction, Introduction to Macro Photography by Neil Fisher. If anybody has the opportunity on YouTube to watch that, um, very, very good information on there. And hopefully it will just kind of reinforce what we've been going through today. Um, so yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed it. Thank you so much for everybody that's kind of come along and thrown in your comments and questions and answers and helped each other out. I apologize that I've maybe may have missed a few questions from people anyway, um, but hopefully it looks like quite a few of you are answering each other, which is absolutely lovely to see.